Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism you declared us to be your children, and gathered us into your one holy church, in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins, and grant us new life through your Spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths. My heart will sing to you and not be silent, O Lord my God. I will give you thanks forever. O Lord my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. O Lord, you brought me up from the grave. Sing to the Lord, you saints of his, praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. To you, O Lord, I called. To the Lord I cried for mercy. Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my help. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths.
us pray together the collect of the day. O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to us when we go astray from your ways, and bring us again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the third Sunday in Lent is from the 20th chapter of Exodus. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. The epistle is from the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. St. Paul writes, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast 
in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins in the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves he said, Get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, It has taken forty-six years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us declare our faith in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, the light of light, very God of very God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men, and for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is today's Gospel reading, in which Jesus declares, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. Buildings are classified by architects and engineers according to their expected lifespan. Because of rapid changes today in technology and frequent adjustments to the building codes, the current trend is for relatively short-term disposable buildings. It is simply easier to tear them down and build anew than to bring older buildings up to the new requirements. That is why many stores, offices, and other commercial buildings erected these days, even many churches, are designed with planned obsolescence. They may look substantial and permanent, but often their materials, design, and construction are actually rated for a lifespan of 25 years or less. Christian churches have traditionally been built to last for generations, with the highest standards of design and construction and best quality materials. That is why in many parts of the world, there are Christian churches over a thousand years old or more that are still being used. Our sanctuary is now a little over 60 years old and would be considered a century building, intended to last at least a hundred years or more. It is a special blessing these days for children and grandchildren to be baptized, confirmed, married, and buried in the same sanctuary as their parents and grandparents. There are not only practical reasons, but also important symbolic significance for making churches well-built, solid, enduring structures. First Peter says, the word of the Lord endures forever, and this is the word that was preached to you. The permanence of Christian church buildings symbolizes the permanence and unchanging nature of the Christian faith and doctrine. On this rock, Jesus says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. James says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. And Hebrew says, Jesus Christ is the same, yesterday, today, and forever. A gentleman was telling me recently with sadness that his pastor, in a church of a different denomination, said that the virgin birth is an unnecessary teaching and it's not important to believe the creeds when they say that Christ was born of the Virgin Mary. I told him he should ask, what else do we say in the creeds that we don't really believe anymore? A few years ago we were blessed to celebrate our congregation's 150th anniversary Unless the Lord's second coming and the end of all things occurs first, Lord willing, another 150 years from now and beyond, our descendants in the faith will still be right here, worshiping the same God, holding fast to the same word and teachings, celebrating the same sacraments. Just as this enduring building has been passed down and will be passed down from generation to generation, we pray that the faith itself will also continue to be passed down here. As Paul says in 2 Thessalonians, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you. In today's Gospel reading, Jesus has an encounter in the temple courts at Jerusalem with the leaders of the temple. They feel assured that their temple must endure because of how long it took to build. It has taken 46 years to build this temple. 
It was indeed a massive, impressive structure, considered comparable to the wonders of the ancient world. But oddly enough, God never intended that ancient temple and its services to be permanent and enduring. God actually instituted all the ceremonies of the Old Testament and the temple itself with planned obsolescence. Paul puts it this way in Colossians. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. The worship life of the Old Testament was destined to come to an end. That is why originally the worship of God by the Israelites was in a tent, a temporary structure to symbolize the temporary nature of the Old Covenant and its worship. It was actually not God's command, but David's own idea to build a permanent temple. For the sacrifices and ceremonies of the Old Covenant all pointed forward to the coming of the promised Messiah. Those sacrifices and ceremonies were intended by God to be only temporary, to be superseded by the New Covenant that the Messiah would usher in when he came. When the woman at the well asked Jesus if the true worship of God was found on Mount Gerizim, with the Samaritans, or only at the temple in Jerusalem, Jesus described the end of the temple and its worship, which he brought with the Messianic era. Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. The time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. It was indeed widely expected that the Messiah, when he came, would totally transform, if not eliminate, the temple and its ceremonies. When Jesus takes it upon himself, in today's Gospel reading, to drive the money changers and merchants from the temple courts, the temple leaders correctly consider that to be an assertion by Jesus of who he is the promised Messiah. So they demand from Jesus a miraculous sign to confirm that he is the Messiah. But you see, they don't want it to be true. They don't really want him to be the Messiah because they have perverted the temple into a money-making machine for themselves and their cronies. As Jesus says, how dare you turn my father's house into a market? They know that if he really is the Messiah, it will mean the end of their cushy, easy existence as parasites skimming off the operation of the temple. Just after today's gospel reading, John says, Jesus did not need to be told about anyone, for he knew what was in a man. So Jesus knows that they ask for a sign, not out of faith, but out of unbelief and rejection of him as the Messiah. Even when he does perform miraculous signs, they still do not believe, but accuse him of being a sorcerer in league with Satan. He is possessed by Beelzebub. It is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. John concludes, even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. So Jesus knows that it is futile trying to convince them with a miraculous sign. For if he is the Messiah, that will mean the end of the temple as they know it and run it. They are so attached to the temple for all the wrong reasons because it is a good source for them of ill-gotten income. So they will just explain away and reject whatever sign he may do. But there is one ultimate sign that will confirm who he is. Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again 
in three days. Jesus' answer is purposely enigmatic, a riddle. It's like the parables designed to get people thinking and stick in their minds. Jesus knows a miraculous sign will not get through to them, but perhaps this enigmatic riddle will. Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. What does he mean? What is he talking about? The temple they are standing in? But that doesn't make any sense. It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. This riddle did indeed stick in the minds of the disciples, and it finally made sense to them three years later on Easter morn. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Paul says in 1 Timothy, Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body. Christ describes his human body as a temple, because in him the divine and human are united. As Paul says in Colossians, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Jesus will prove he is divine, the God-man, the Messiah, by doing something no one else has done or could do. Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. Muhammad's body is buried in Medina, Saudi Arabia. Confucius' body is buried in Khufu, China. Buddha's body was cremated and his ashes are buried in India. But Paul says in Romans, Christ was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority, to prove that you really are the Messiah? Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They would indeed attempt to destroy the temple of his body three years later, when he was crucified, dead, and buried. But as Peter proclaimed at Pentecost, you put him to death by nailing him to the cross, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Christ's resurrection from the dead proves who he is, the divine Son of God, come down from heaven and made man, the promised Messiah, your Savior. Paul describes in Colossians what Christ's death and resurrection means for you, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again. Paul explains in Romans that through baptism, you are united with Christ in his death and resurrection. You see, you are called a follower of Christ, not only because you follow him in this life, but also at the end of your life, you will follow him on the same journey he took at the end of his life. 
through death and the grave and into eternal life. All of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. So when Jesus declares, destroy this temple and I will raise it again, it's not only a prophecy about his own resurrection. It is also a promise to you of your resurrection. Job puts it this way, after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. Paul asks in 1 Corinthians, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? Just as Jesus raised from the dead on the third day the temple of his own body, he will raise from the dead on the last day the temple of your body. Do not be amazed at this, Jesus says, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear the voice of the Son of Man and come out. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. The decay and destruction of your body culminates in your death and burial, but really it is an ongoing process already during your life. If not for the fall of humanity into sin, our world and our bodies would be perfect. However, we don't live in a perfect world anymore, and the lingering effects of the fall cause disease and decay, a gradual decline and ongoing destruction of our bodies even during our lifetimes. But Jesus promises not only about his body, but also about your body. Destroy this temple and I will raise it again. Jesus told the thief on the cross beside him who trusted in him, Today you will be with me in paradise. At the moment of death, your soul will depart your body and go to be with Christ in paradise. As Paul says in Philippians, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. And at the last day, your body will be raised up, restored to life, and transformed to glorious perfection. As Paul also says in Philippians, the Lord Jesus Christ will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. That's why Revelation says that in heaven there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Each week we confess in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the resurrection of the body. Or in the Nicene Creed, I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Those aren't just empty words that we recite. For Jesus not only prophesies his own resurrection, he also promises your resurrection. When he declares, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again. Amen.
Heavenly Father, you demonstrated your love for us sinners when we were still powerless to save ourselves and sent your Son to suffer and die in our place. The trials, sufferings, humiliation, bitter agony, and death which he endured were all for us. The iniquity of us all was laid upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Give us grace to live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died for us, and rose again. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give your blessing to all the nations of the earth. Endow the leaders in our land with wisdom, that we may lead quiet and peaceful lives, and our nation may prosper. Hold your protecting hand over our country, and spare us from disaster. Bless those who serve to enforce our laws and protect us, and keep safe those serving in our nation's defensive forces. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Nourish and sustain your church through the proclamation of the gospel and reception of your holy sacraments. Make all pastors diligent to preach your holy word, and strengthen us through the gospel of grace and the power of your Holy Spirit to lead holy lives according to it. Bless the work of all our missionaries, especially Reverend Hans and Gretchen Trinkline, who are sponsored by our Synod in South Korea. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen us by the grace of the sacrament of Christ's body and blood, that we who receive this bread of life and drink this cup of salvation may live devoutly for him in the world and remain steadfast in the true faith unto life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, in your word you tell us, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Let us not forget to call upon you in prayer and turn to you with our every need and concern. Here are the silent prayers we each bring before you now in our hearts for persons, needs, and problems, joys and thanksgivings of special concern to us.
In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve, who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
strengthen you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit. 